Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the NPS Archaeology Program Speaker Series for Fall 2013. My name is Karen Mudar, and I'm a senior archaeologist in the Washington office. This is the third in a series about geophysical technologies and archaeology. It's very nice to have you all this afternoon. Uh, it's a great lineup of um, speakers, and I hope that you can make time for all of them. Two weeks ago, Richard Scott, a retired NPS archaeologist, talked to us about the use of metal detecting in scientific investigations. And Scott has done pioneering work with metal detecting, beginning with his dissertation work at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So it was a special treat to hear him talk. The date for the next webinar will return to the customary Thursday. Andrew Labounty, who is an NPS um, employee, will present Capturing Cultural Landscapes, GIS, and Historical Imagery at Voyagers National Park. The presentation will summarize results of research that he's conducting at the park. And he's combined historical aerial imagery with early shoreline surveys and modern archaeological information and digitized thousands of cultural features into a geodatabase. His study is a good illustration of the ways that archaeologists can use GIS to query and visualize cultural activities revealing spatial patterns over time and directing future research. Please join us for Andrew's talk on November 21st at 3 o'clock. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I have some administration to take care of for people who are new to the webinar series. All of the lectures will be recorded, so please be mindful of that when you're asking questions. Please set your phone to mute. Um, and remember to unmute your phone when you want to ask a question. The recorded webcast will be posted on the NPS Archaeology Program website at the URL at the bottom of your computer screen. And if you can't see the URL, you need to start investigating the problem right away so that you don't miss any of the presentations. I'll also make an announcement in the Archaeology eGram when the, um, when the webcasts are posted. If you don't receive the eGram and would like to, also let me know, and I will add your name to the mailing list. If you want to get a, a, announcements for this webinar series, also contact me. Our speaker for today, Kenneth Krame, Krame is Professor of Anthropology at the University of Arkansas, where he is Director of the Archaeo Imaging Lab, devoted to the detection of archaeological remains through geophysical prospecting and remote sensing. Most of Kwame's career has focused on archaeological prospecting, beginning with pioneer work in GIS-based predictive modeling of archaeological locations in the 1980s. From the early 1990s, he has pursued archaeological detection through geophysical prospecting. Tsami is author of over 100 publications and 150 technical reports on GIS, archaeological modeling, spatial analysis, geophysical applications, and remote sensing. He is associate editor of the journal Archaeological Prospection and is on the advisory board of the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. Although his geophysical fieldwork takes him to projects worldwide, Kwame specializes in the archaeology of the American Great Plains and Rocky Mountain West. Today, he will talk to us about geophysical prospecting, which, he says, has come a long way. The instrumentation has become faster, less expensive, and easier to use. The computer software has improved to make data, data handling, portrayal, and interpretation easier. Technical improvements, particularly in the representation of survey results, now offer views of the subsurface with unparalleled clarity. And many of us have come to realize the potential that such visualizations offer because they often indicate exactly where buried archaeological structures and features are located. And this information can represent a significant cost savings to projects. Moreover, these surveys are non-invasive. 
and they leave the ground undisturbed. Unlike traditional excavations, which require significant time and investigate limited areas measured only in square meters, geophysical surveys are extremely fast and investigate hectares and can be surveyed in as little as a day. This last feature has proved to be evolutionary to the revolutionary to the growth of a true landscape archaeology. Ken's presentation will examine the four principal geophysical prospecting methods used in archaeology, and these are magnetometry, electrical resistivity, electromagnetic induction, and ground penetrating radar. Each interacts with the subsurface in a different way, and they typically indicate different physical properties of the soil. And what each yields is often complementary, and together, when integrated through GIS, these methods offer an increasingly comprehensive view of buried archaeological deposits, as Ken will discuss with us today. So welcome, and thanks for, for speaking to us, Ken. Well, thank you very much, uh, Karen, and thank you for the invitation to present today. And greetings, everyone out there. It's kind of unnerving. I'm staring at my computer, but I'm talking to a, a host, so hello. <laughs> um, as Karen said, I'll be talking about geophysical prospecting and archaeology, and it's going to be a three-part discussion. Um, first, I'll look at the role of geophysics in the, in the larger field of archaeology and where it might fit in, and then Secondly, some basic principles of geophysical surveys in general. And then finally, uh, close with a review of um, these four principal techniques that were, were listed. So let me just start here. And um, let's see. I, I, Karen, I think I need some controls to – I don't see those controls for advancing the slides here. Um, it's down in the lower left-hand corner. Do you see the arrow? No, yeah, they, they're not here. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, how about if I advance for you? Okay, let's try that. Okay, so um, well, you know, what is archaeological prospecting? Here is a, a place to start, and basically, it's you know, any technique that will let us uh, gain some information about the subsurface, uh, so informing about archaeological conditions, and that would include satellite remote sensing, aerial photography, and ground-based geophysics, which is the focus today. But then there's all, also other methods, such as uh, LIDAR mapping, which gives mi microtopography, uh, subsurface artifact distribution mapping, which is highly successful in plowed fields and desert landscapes where uh, broad distributions of artifacts can indicate something about the archaeological record. Uh, soil coring and probing has been successfully used in a, a variety of places to, um, uh, you know, peer into the subsurface. And then finally, geochemistry. So there's a ho host of techniques uh, one might uh, utilize to see into the ground. And uh, I'm just going to focus on ground-based geophysics, which probably is the most productive of all of these methods. Um, and next slide, I guess. Well, here we have a, a slide that shows what might be considered a traditional view of geophysics as an archaeological feature finder. I often work in the northern Great Plains, and um, a particular target is, is, are these corn storage pits, because they're, uh, they're time sensitive, they're only used for a few years, and they're full of uh, uh, artifacts and ecofacts like pollen and corn kernels and seeds and things like that, bones, and um, so archaeologists want to find them. But they're really hard to find because they're so small. And uh, it wasn't until really the advent of uh, magnetometry surveys in the plains that we could locate these. And we see on the, on the far right uh, a magnetic radiometry image showing lots and lots of uh, corn storage pits. They become visible because they, they're filled with um, magnetically enriched settlement soils. And it's kind of like sticking a bar magnet in the ground, making them easy to find with a magnetometer. And uh, with such a map, we could pinpoint excavations exactly now. And, and prior to geophysics, it was just haphazard and, and sheer guesswork, basically. Um, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, so here's the traditional view of uh, anyway. uh, geophysics and all, all the methods. With you, know, Basically, I think most archaeologists feel uh, 
the epitome of archaeology is excavation, and that lies at the top, and everything else contributes um, to, to excavation and knowledge of a site in this way, where geophysics would be a, a, a subset member uh, akin to something like pollen analysis or lithic analysis, uh, contributing to archaeological knowledge. And what I want to do is go through and, and, and look at what geophysics offers and then offer a different view here. So, so next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Here's um, the broader goals of geophysics might highlight this. And, and uh, we have some workmen here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but detecting and locating archaeological sites and features is uh, a, a major activity. Secondly, uh, mapping and interpreting uh, subsurface features within archaeological sites. So we could make broad maps of uh, a site or settlement and uh, work you know, with those maps to, to figure out what's, what's going on in the site. And then with those maps, we could you know, pinpoint features for subsequent excavation. But I think these, these bottom two on the slide are, are uh, more important or interesting because uh, through geophysics, we could offer primary data for understanding site content, structure, and layout. For example, we could give a map of a settlement showing uh, its, its key components. And then within a region, we could uh, actually get at settlement pattern studies by looking at uh, distributions of settlements and hamlets uh, for a true landscape archaeology. And I emphasize these as primary data because already a, a number of theses and dissertations have been pursued uh, using geophysical information as the primary data. Uh, from which to base inferences, such as uh, site structure, site layout, number of houses, uh, uh, things like that. So um, we, we see a, a richer perspective for geophysics here. And then on, on the next slide, uh, uh, some of the advantages uh, include non-invasive. It, you know, once a geophysicist leaves the site, there's no disturbance to the ground. Uh, most of the techniques, or many of the techniques, are passive. A few are active, inject, injecting radio waves or microwaves, but uh, they leave the ground undisturbed. And uh, through geophysics, it might be the only way to learn about the subsurface over large regions. We could uh, you know, survey a, a huge settlement and show all of its features, whereas it's you know, generally uh, impossible to do with archaeology. It's also uh, efficient and, and cost effective and, and fairly reliable, and it's getting better all the time in terms of locating significant uh, uh, archaeological features. And then interpretation is, is um, based on, on patterns we could see in the, uh, in the imagery, such as uh, rectangles and squares that are of cultural origin, and then uh, uh, physical principles that uh, coming from the, the, the theory behind the geophysical methods. So together, uh, there's a lot of advantages that uh, geophysics offered to archaeology. So if we go to the next slide here, uh, we have a, a better view might be uh, something like this, where geophysics is one data source for knowledge about a site or region, uh, similar to excavation, which is a different type of data source where that, that yields uh, material culture and uh, vertical relationships, this kind of thing. So uh, I just view this as another technique that you know even could surpass. Uh, excavation for its information content because we could see what the nature of a whole settlement looks like for the first time. So so next slide. Uh, let, me, let me start with uh, overviewing uh, types of geophysical surveys. And ba basically there, there's a, a, a dual division I want to just focus on here. There's a few other types that are, are not so relevant, but uh, one would be yeah. vertical or profile surveys. And on the left here, we see a survey we just completed at Toltec Mounds Archaeological Park uh, near near Little Rock, Arkansas. This is a state park, but it's got some, some great looking mounds. And we've never been able to see into the mounds, so we did a vertical um, um, multi-electrode resistivity survey that, that went meters into the mound and gave for the first time a, a cross-sectional um, a view uh, of this mound. And we, we actually ended up doing about 70 cross-sections, so we actually have a 3D model of the interior of the mound at this time. But um, what I want to focus on are, are lateral or area surveys, where instead of going vertically in a profile, we, we survey horizontally to give plan maps of what might be in the ground. And this is a, the most common archaeological uh, application of geophysics, because um, 
based on the shapes you could see in, in the imagery, you could interpret what's out there. And what we see here is a, a, a mapping of a magnetic radiometry at Huff Village in North Dakota. This is a, a state park up there, and it's a, a famous site because there's a, these rectangular houses that exist in long rows within a fortified network of defenses. And um, it's, it's a huge survey, but for, you know, for the first time, we, you know, we get a real good layout of, of uh, the village plus uh, interior contents of some of the houses. And we'll look at some of those a little bit later. So if we go to the next one here. So let me review some of the uh, the basic methods here. Uh, uh, for what one is in field methods, and, and a key problem is, is uh, placing the instruments on the ground and knowing where your measurements come from. So traditionally, we have used uh, lawn tapes or, or, or ropes uh, to indicate our transect lines, and basically you, you move your instrument along uh, these lines or, or transects. And then on the tapes, uh, we have meter marks, and you can see on the upper right, uh, these red arrows are, are pointing to meter marks um, that you know, in indicate where you are in this landscape, and then the meter marks uh, can help yeah. you place the measurements accurately. And some instruments, such as an electrical um, resistivity meter, which we see in the upper right, you might take one or two measurements per, per linear meter, whereas a magnetometer might, might take uh, uh, eight or 10 per, per linear meter, and a, and a ground penetrating radar, 20 to 50 per linear meter. So, uh, you know, the sampling controls the resolution you might see. And then the, the big uh, uh, block view in the middle shows how the surveys are organized. We usually uh, break down the survey into smaller blocks, uh, often 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 meters. And this allows us to confront a, a large landscape piecemeal, so we, we do a little bit at a time. Um, and that way, if, if the day ends, we, we, we know which block we end in, or if it starts raining, you can finish a block, and then pick up in the next block the, uh, the next day. Um, and so we, through computer software, we just tile together all these blocks to make a, a composite image of a site or a region. So that's you know, the basic field methods are, are shown there. And let's, let's see the next slide then. Um, let me talk something about anomalies. So, some you know another basic background, and basically, an anomaly is uh, some kind of measurements that are are different than a normal background. So, here we have uh, an example in the upper right of some uh, electric, electrical resistivity data, and we can see the raw data. And most of the background typical measurements are shown with a middle tone, uh, you know, reds and whites here, uh, and that's the normal background without anything occurring in it. And the anomalies are, are uh, very high measurements shown in black. So e extreme measurements of former anomalies. And we can see in the, the histogram in the center of the slide shows all the measurements from that upper right view. And we would define anomalies are, are, as being the extreme measurements, say in the upper right tail here. And we might classify uh, uh, all the measurements bigger than one standard deviation from the mean as being of interest in, in the, the mapping in the middle right shows uh, um, the, the key anomalies in this landscape, revealing some, some rooms and house floors and things like that. Now, a, a problem with uh, the interpretation of anomalies in, in uh, uh, archaeological applications is that many are caused by biological or geological or various soil processes uh, uh, that are out there. So rodent holes and tree throws and uh, Paleo channels, all this kind of uh, kind, kinds of things show up in our data. So the real task is to sort out um, cultural from natural anomalies, right? And then in, in the cultural sphere, we also have the issue of uh, unwanted cultural anomalies, such as recent plow marks. We want to filter those out if we can. So uh, yeah, interpretation gets you know it's a little bit difficult because there's so many layers of uh, uh, anomalies out there, and we're trying to pick out the ones that are relevant to the project and culture and time period at hand. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit of, about anomalies. This is from one of the, the better books out there, Seen Beneath the Soil. But um, you can see that the top row sketch is of living cultures. We see, might see a, a native settlement and a Euro-American settlement. Um, and eventually, these turn into archaeological features in the, in the second row there, where you have some uh, ditches and, and post molds and pits and, and foundations and uh, remains of a kiln. And we might imagine a, a, 
a transect, right? So our area surveys are done on, on lawn transects. If we pulled out one transect of electrical resistivity where we're injecting a current into the ground, we might see a high resistivity over ditches and pits uh, if the fill is, is more resistant to electrical, uh, uh, electrical current. Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's, they're filled with moisture, so it, it could be lower resistivity, and that's why there's a, like a dual curve shown there. Uh, we also note that the, the stone foundations of that, that uh, building on the right show up as, as very high resistivity readings. Because usually it's a, a stone is highly resistant and it will show up as some really strong anomalies. Then we take a different instrument, such as a magnetometer, and we might find that the fill is uh, more magnetic uh, in the ditches or pits. And we've also found that uh, firing builds up magnetism greatly. And, uh, on where the locus of the kiln was, we have a, a huge magnetic anomaly uh, indicated. So but both of these illustrate how uh, archaeological features correspond to physical differences, which are picked up by instruments key to particular physical properties of the ground, one being full of electrical current and another being um, magnetic field properties. Uh, next slide. Um, just a, a, a brief mention that data processing is really important. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when we get data out of an instrument, it's not very clear or even muddy looking. And uh, I picked this uh, data set in the upper left, which was, looks terrible. And it's because we had a, a, a drought, and then it rained, and it was really wet, and all the electrical properties of the ground changed. And so I said, well, let's just take a slice through uh, all these radar profiles, and that's what it looks like. And after some significant processing, which we see in the middle, we uh, did various GPR types of things. We, we came up with a very nice image of, a, of, of uh, the subsurface there showing part of a, a historic town that I'll talk about later. On, on the right side, we see uh, some post-processing. I mentioned uh, cultural features that are not one. We, here we have some plow marks over a, a prehistoric Na Native American village in South Dakota. Um, and there's a, a technique uh, known as Fourier methods where we could uh, uh, process those plow marks out to receive a, a, obtain a clear image uh, by removing the, the regular periodicities of the plow marks there, uh, making interpretation much easier. And we do see on the bottom right there uh, a fortification ditch with some bastion loops, and all the blobby things are uh, indications of individual houses in the village. Uh, the next slide. So I'm going to go to the, the second part now, are, are some... Uh, uh, principles, and uh, let me just emphasize, if there are questions out there, uh, feel free to, to chime in, but uh, uh, let's go to the next slide, and I'll cover some basic principles. Uh, uh, one, one being that uh, using multiple geophysical methods uh, is, is really useful because uh, one device generally picks up one physical property of the subsurface, and by looking at several properties, you can see different dimensions. On the left here, we have a uh, uh, Whistling Elk Village, which is that village in the previous slide. And we can see the magnetometry picked up the outlines of the square house uh, shown, shown in black. And black is, generally indicates uh, high measurements in geophysics. And uh, this house was burned, and so it was, became highly magnetic out in the burned zone. And the hearth was magnetic as well, right in the middle. And you can see some small dots around the hearth. Those are uh, indications of the main support posts for the roof. Now, if we go to the bottom left, we see an um, electrical resistivity image of the same house that shows its resistant floor uh, and the lawn linear entryway uh, uh, going to the lower right there. So uh, these really complement each other, um, filling out different elements of, of the structure of this house. Now, on the, on the right side, we see Cougar Bar Village in Idaho on the Snake River, and we have a, a Nez Perce uh, lawn house with some other houses shown. And the magnetic radiometry shows some of the uh, uh, centrally placed hearths down the lawn axis of the interior um, uh, on the lawn house, and then um, a large midden t to uh, uh, the north of it or uh, above it uh, in the image. And on the right, we see um, a circular house that probably has an adjoining entryway and then a partition through that house uh, and, and a midden to the, to the north as well. Uh, so the, 
the magnetic image is very informative, but on, on, the, on in the lower part, the, the uh, resistivity shows that these house floors have a, a dual nature. We see in black high resistant areas, uh, where uh, in the lawn house, um, kind of going along the, the hearth line, and then in the, in the uh, houses B and C, we see uh, the, each of those are partitioned uh, to uh, uh, high resistant and low resistant areas. And, we think this corresponds to use areas where uh, the areas of the floor that were walked on and, and used regularly show high resistance because of the packing. Uh, uh, you have a, a higher density of, uh, of uh, sediment there. And then the, the sleeping or storage areas show low resistance in these houses. And this cor corresponds to some things that are known from ethnography of, uh, in, in this area. So again, the, the dual nature fills out uh, some more information in, in, in the in the data sets here. Uh, next slide. Uh, a second major principle is, is get the big picture. And, uh, you know, I often have uh, uh, arguments with my uh, archaeological friends who focus on excavation that, uh, yeah, you'd be lucky to get a 5% sample. And, and, you know, if you take a giant settlement, even a 5% sample, which would be enormous, constitutes just like pinpricks into a site, uh, just a, you know, a few small trenches. And essentially, archaeologists would learn through excavation very much about very little of the site. You get, you know, some uh, good samples of material culture and vertical stratigraphy and dates and things like that, which are, are highly important. But little would, would be revealed about site structure. And that's why uh, geophysics can be such a complement tradi to traditional work, where we see on the right, uh, surveyed in the course of a, a, a few days, um, a complete outline of the structure of this village where we have a, a fortification ditch um, with, with evenly spaced bastion loops on the outer rim. Um, the, the blobby features are, are houses, as I mentioned. We have a large, larger square ceremonial house right in the, in the upper middle. And then the lower right, um, there's a hints of a second interior village with the fortification ditch. And I don't have a pointer here, but you could kind of see an uh, uh, arcing and then a higher density of blobby things are, which point to houses in the lower right of the, the settlement. Yeah, so that, uh, right now uh, the outer ditch is being traced, uh, which I could see here, and then, uh, then there's an uh, inner ditch uh, coming across kind of like the middle. Uh, and the su southern end is a berm against the Missouri River where the Army Corps of Engineers has stabilized the site uh, from eroding further. So uh, let's move to principle three in the next slide. Um, and this is one point to interpretation. Is that um, features of cultural origin tend to exhibit regular geometric shapes. So they tend to be square or rectangular or circular or, or linear. And they have very distinct boundaries. And I, I think all the examples here uh, point to this phenomenon where we see uh, uh, round um, earth lodges on the right or uh, square uh, rooms of a Pueblo in the upper right and, and uh, some historic uh, features on the, on the left three images, including roads and things like that. Whereas in the bottom of the slide we see uh, you know, natural features uh, tend to be less regular and, uh, or highly irregular and with, with indistinct boundaries. So that's you know, a key principle when you look at the imagery is uh, how do you recognize what's cultural? Will you, will you look for these regular geometries? Let's go to the next slide, please. And then a fifth principle, this is just an example, but uh, there's a lot of theory behind each of these methods. And if you know some of the theory associated with each technique, it aids interpretation. And, and with magnetometry, as I mentioned, we know that uh, intensive firing creates uh, uh, strong magnetism, thermal remnant uh, mag magnetic anomalies. And the left two uh, show uh, burn houses um, with, with house perimeters and uh, interior uh, Hearths being shown. And the right uh, shows an experiment we did at one site where um, we had our magnetic image and then we excavated the house and we screened all the fired earth, which you could see in the photo in the upper right. And, and we, what we did was we uh, weighed the fired earth weight and you could see uh, uh, weighed by a, a square meter here, the shape of the fired earth weight corresponds exactly with the magnetic anomaly uh, strongly showing this correspondence. Uh, next slide. And then uh, the, the last principle is uh, uh, 
validation is really important through excavation because, you know, uh, people who do this kind of work, we could uh, guess or make informed guesses or uh, estimate through theory or what we think is down there, but we really would like some validation. And there's often a disconnect because um, I'll do a geophysical survey and some months later maybe the archaeologists will excavate and sometimes they never hear what they found. But uh, here's some examples where uh, in the upper left, we have uh, some uh, building footings that were you know, illustrated by excavation. Uh, walls in a room that turn out to be uh, uh, concrete uh, in, in this particular historic site. And then again, uh, the, the corn storage pits, uh, uh, where we can you know, validate, validate that they are indeed corn storage pits through, through excavation, and not maybe a coyote den or something like that. Okay, well, next slide. So uh, the, the final uh, in, in longest segment here would be uh, uh, an overview of some of the geophysical techniques. So let's uh, let's start with magnetometry on the next slide. So just a, a quick look at some of the instrumentation. There's a, a wide array of instruments uh, made by a, a variety of companies, and, and most of the uh, instruments used by um, archaeogeophysicists today are, are gradiometers. So it's actually uh, two magnetometers housed in a, a lawn tube where uh, they constantly difference each other. And when the, the, what the differencing does is it removes the effects of um, uh, the background magnetic field that's constantly varying. And so uh, you get a reading of what's actually going in the ground. Um, and what's, what's going on in the, the last few years are, are dual gradiometers, where you see on the, on the right half of the images uh, actually have two poles. So uh, if you walk one transect, you actually survey two in, in one passage. And so this has been a real boon to improving the speed of surveys. Um, so so we, you know, I've used just about all, each one of these instruments in the, in the past, and, and now we're using uh, uh, some of these dual sensors now for much stronger surveys. I might add that in, in now, uh, nowadays and some of our European colleagues are using uh, tractors pulling large arrays of gradiometers, maybe uh, eight or even uh, a dozen in one passage at a time. They could do huge fields very rapidly. but. Uh, I haven't seen this in the U.S. yet beyond maybe four sensors at once. So, um, well, next slide. So let's just talk about some magnetic principles, and, 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 uh, and I'll focus here more on the theory of magnetometry since I think it's one of the more important methods. But one, one is that the act of, that the human, of human occupation itself exacerbates or magnifies a, a magnetism in a site. And we, we have already learned that, that firing um, – enhances magnetism, well, uh, by building fires again and again and then cleaning out those fires and dispersing the fire materials, uh, the, the soils in, a, in the settlement become uh, magnetically enriched. Uh, there's also firing of buildings in, you know, uh, through abandonment or through a, a sacking of a village, for example, which in, increases settlement magnetism. There's also, you know, fired bricks or uh, fired uh, artifacts are made, such as bricks and ceramics. Uh, these two, when they end up in the archaeological record, contribute to magnetic enrichment. And then there's um, other processes, such as the adding of organic waste in middens or just uh, through a settlement. And uh, organic waste tends to promote bacterial growth. Uh, and it, some bacteria actually uh, uh, aggregate magnetic particles in the soil, contributing to a magnetic enrichment. So uh, what we see here are just some of the processes that contribute to uh, magnetic enrichment in settlement soils. Okay, so there are uh, anthrocells or you know, anthropogenically created soils in a settlement are, are magnetically enriched. And we see uh, the image on the right are, is a 3D view of some mounds. These are mid-mounds in a, a site, and, and their magnetic enrichment shown in black uh, on top here. Um, next slide, please. Here's just a, a little experiment I did uh, at Larson Village in North Dakota. Uh, so the, all these sites are covered in corn storage pits, and uh, we surveyed the. We have a magnetic image showing uh, uh, you know, the magnetic measurements across the site. And what we we did is um, uh, we, we took you know validated corn storage pits that we excavated or cored and um, found the maximum magnetism in each. And, and what we see are, are three zones in this village. The village core was occupied the longest, uh, maybe as long as 300 years. Um, and then the, the village mid-zone was occupied uh, less uh, of a period of time. And then the outside village was barely occupied from uh, only a brief period. 
And what happened is most of these villages contracted uh, through um, a series of smallpox epidemics. So we see a, you know, early settlement probably in the late 1400s going into the late 1700s here. Uh, but if we look at the, the graphs on the right, we could see, um, you know, this is magnetism in corn storage pits, which are you know, pretty much all um, identical, one and a half to two meters deep, uh, bell-shaped in cross-section and filled with sediment soil, that those that were in the longer occupied village core, the magnetism is much higher than in the middle or, or outside zones where the magnetism is quite weak. You can see that in either one of those graphs. So this kind of illustrates quantitatively um, the uh, uh, nature of magnetic enrichment and how it varies across the site. Uh, next slide. Our second principle, uh, people create fires. Well, I've, I've already discussed this one. So I'll move to principle three, is that people also make fired artifacts. And this would be ceramics and, and bricks are two of the most common ones. And what we see here, um, you have to kind of squint, but it's an outline of a, the rectangle of a, of a, a church that was um, uh, burned down during the Civil War. But um, there, there's bricks, and you can see where it's labeled B. These are uh, remains of bricks beneath the surface that uh, show up in the magnetometer. So we have... a uh, the outlines of the foundation and then some interior building piers and brick that show up quite well. Uh, so, uh, you know, given this is kind of enhancement, and this is all validated by the, the Arkansas uh, Archaeological Survey did excavate this particular site, so we knew that there were bricks and uh, only about 35 centimeters beneath the surface. Uh, next slide. Our fourth principle. Uh, relevant to magnetism here is, is that uh, when people construct things, they tend to accumulate topsoil in many constructions. And on the upper left, we see uh, the Great Bear effigy from uh, 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 Effigy Mounds, uh, uh, the National Monument in, in Iowa, uh, where the mounding of the soil, right, so we find that the topsoil itself tends to be more magnetic. And the mounding of that topsoil uh, creates this magnetic anomaly. In the, the figure B there, um, we have the circular ring of an earth lodge. And uh, an earth lodge is just a dome of wood uh, uh, that was covered with a, maybe a, a quarter or third of a meter of soil. And that, that soil would erode off, off the roof and build up a ring or berm around the lodge. Um, and we, we see the, some in magnetic enrichment where that ring occurs because of the thicker mounting of topsoil. And see, we see a ditch feature, uh, and next to the ditch, well, the, the soil has to come out of the ditch, and it's usually piled next to the ditch, and we see uh, a little bit of raised magnetism in black next to the ditch right there where the arrows are shown. D shows uh, some fortification ditches at the double ditch site in North Dakota. Um, and all three of these ditches are filled in, so that you, uh, you can't see these on the surface, but uh, uh, they're filled with sediment soil, which is highly magnetic, and so we could see the magnetic outlines of these, these ditches. And then finally, in E, uh, all the red arrows are, are pointing to filled-in corn storage pits that surround a house. So you can see um, this rounded rectangular house uh, with um, its northern and eastern boundaries marked by corn storage pits filled with sediment soils. So um, you know, the mounting or accumulation of, of sediment soil or topsoil creates magnetic anomalies that are highly detectable. Now, now, principle five in the next slide uh, shows the the inverse of this, where you know constructions also remove topsoil or activities remove topsoil. In the upper left, we see um, uh, the, the far left a, a two track. That's a, a farmer would dro drive his uh, truck over this same track, and uh, the truck truck grew through the magnetic topsoil into the subsoil, uh, leaving negative magnetic anomalies. We see a, a similar two track, but that, that's, those are twin cattle tracks uh, through the central part of the image. Um, we see there, there's two holes, uh, small white holes near the, the top of the image. Those are looters' holes where the, the topsoil has been taken away, so we have you know, negative anomalies there. And that, that big uh, circle on the left, that's an archaeological excavation from um, 1937 that was never backfilled. And you can see uh, the negative magnetism in the middle because all the topsoil has been taken away and mounted around its perimeter, high magnetism, because it's been mounted. Okay, so there's a, a, a lot going on with this negative magnetism. And then on, on the far right of that uh, upper left image, you can see uh, uh, 
part of a fortification system, which uh, on the bottom I image, I, I show a cross-section through. We actually excavated a profile here, and we see a, a fortification ditch that's been partially filled. And then there's lower uh, magnetism on either end of the ditch with some raised magnetism in the middle of the ditch, but, but very subtly raised. And that's because of the fill of the ditch. Some of the uh, inflowing soil has filled the ditch, creating a slightly bump of uh, magnetism in the middle. And then uh, on the right side of the ditch is the stacked topsoil taking out and then a hearth. So you can see, uh, you know, the hearth is fired magnetism there, but the mounting phenomenon by the stacked soil. And then generally where the soil has been remo removed, a negative anomaly. Um, so going left to right, we have, you know, low and then high and low and high. Uh, going across, uh, showing the nature of the ditch. And we often find ditches looking like this as a, a twin stripe because of uh, the fill sometimes uh, uh, is, is somewhat magnetic in the middle. Now, the, the upper right is kind of interesting. This is courtesy of Jay Johnson, my colleague at the University of Mississippi. Uh, but this is a, 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 the Confederate Cemetery at, at uh, the University of Mississippi uh, where you have rows and rows of graves. Now, what, what happens when you, you um, make a burial you, burial, you dig a grave shaft, and if you don't replace the topsoil at the top, uh, you would get a negative anomaly over it, or, or a low, right, and low being white here. And so evidently, when these burials were placed, uh, the topsoil was not put on top of the grave, and we have dips going across the magnetic field row by row, indicating where all these graves are located. Okay, so, uh, a good uh, ill exa example of... Uh, magnetism in, in, in uh, gray finding. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's uh, 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 another principle that, you know, constructions import stone or sediments. Um, the Fort Clark trading post on the left, we have a magnetic sandstone used as foundation blocks, um, showing the outline to this trading post. And on the right, I take this from uh, the Roman city of Imperius in Spain, where they used a limestone in construction that lacked any any uh, uh, iron-based particles at all, so it was non-magnetic. And so we have um, negative anomalies over the, all the walls, and the fill that filled all the rooms was of a, a more magnetic sand that, that actually uh, uh, shows up as black here. So uh, kind of the inverse where we have, uh, whenever we walked over a wall with a magnetometer, it would go negative, uh, showing this principle. So, uh, And then the, the final one in the next slide, is uh, pertains to iron artifacts, and so uh, you know uh, humans. Uh, so many cultures have used iron artifacts that they really show up uh, uh, to to a magnetometer as strong dipolar anomalies, where you can see uh, uh, you know p uh, positive and negative poles. And here we have the, the battlefield of Prairie Grove near uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, which had over 60 uh, artillery pieces in, in in the battle, and much of what they shot was based in iron, and so um, a key action of the, the battle was near the Borden House, which we see in the slide, um, and it's just, just loaded with iron dipoles. And uh, this was uh, validated by the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, where they, they did extensive excavation here and found li literally tons of uh, burst shells and, and uh, other iron pieces uh, fr from the Civil War. Uh, so, so next slide, let's go... Uh, to something different, electrical resistivity, our second method. Um, and then what we're doing here is we're going to inject a, an electrical current into the earth uh, and look at its uh, 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 the, the resistance to the flow of that current. And what I try to show here is a, an archaeological profile uh, where we see two layers, and at the interface, more or less, some archaeological features such as a pit, a hearth, and a wall. And as we take our, our electrical readings going across this, we might find uh, that the pit shows negative or low anomalies because maybe it's, uh, it, it holds moisture it's, or, or wetter, and so it would lower the resistance to a current. The hearth, on the other, other hand, might be totally invisible, not having different electrical properties, whereas uh, the wall might be a pile of bricks. Um, bricks and stone tend to be highly resistant, showing a positive anomaly. And... Um, what, what causes these resistivity differences, you know, things like, like uh, density and particle size and, and uh, uh, porosity and salinity, and there's, there's a whole slew of factors. But um, 
Mainly, our resistivity surveys are sensitive mostly to stone and brick, and then moisture variations in the ground. And some people call these uh, um, uh, mappings of, of moisture across the site, and, and, and indeed they can be. So let's look at the next slide and uh, look at just some of the theories. So we have uh, on the left uh, just a, a basic circuit showing a, a battery and current going through it, and, and Ohm's law. And, base, and, and what we have is that resistance equals voltage over current. And so with that knowledge, we could set up a, a circuit where uh, on the right we see the, the, the winner or venter array uh, with a circuit injecting a current to the ground. So we see the current lines uh, flowing through the soil here. Um, and we measure with a current meter what, what the current is. So that's, that's I in the equation. And then we have a, a, a voltmeter in the middle where we, we measure voltage changes. Voltage divided by current gives us resistance. And what we do, we move such an array over the landscape measuring changes in resistance. Now, there, there's a whole bunch of different arrays, and this is like the, the founding array or, or um, main one that was developed originally, and there's other ones that are more beneficial. But the, the, the nature of these electrodes um, it, uh, uh, gives us a geometric factor that you might correct. And you see in the bottom the equation there, uh, it's a simple correction for the uh, nature of that array. Uh, now, in archaeology, we use a slightly different one shown on the next slide, uh, which we call a twin probe array. And what it, all it is, it's a winter array split in half. So we take two of the electrodes and we put them out remotely, uh, and then we only move two at a time, uh, housed in this, uh, a rigid frame. And uh, you can see uh, our cur two current uh, electrodes are we set up our circuit down there, and we just sample voltage changes. And uh, if we vary the space in those electrodes, we're going to sample uh, at different depths. So uh, closely spaced electrodes shown in the upper right would sample very shallowly, uh, such as a quarter meter beneath the surface. Then moving the electrodes apart, we could sample at a half meter, one meter, or, e or even deeper. So uh, that electrode spacing controls how, how deep we're sensing. And you, you might see that uh, um, on the left figure here, as we move that uh, the, the voltage uh, electrode P2 uh, further out, we're, we're, we're sensing deeper voltage lines uh, uh, and, and getting a deeper prospecting by, by moving that electrode farther out. Well, uh, next slide. So here, here's just uh, examples of uh, one of the, the main resistance meters that, uh, uh, that are used in archaeology, the, the geoscan research instrument. And you could have uh, two or, or up to uh, seven or eight different electrodes um, on the reading, per permitting uh, multiple depths be, be acquired at once, or uh, shallow depths and deep depths, and, and, uh, and, and pretty good results. So uh, basically, you, you move this over the landscape. You could see in the upper right figure some of the uh, survey guide tapes. Uh, sampling one or two measurements per meter and uh, acquiring data that way. So let's look at some of the applications of this in the next slide. Um, so this is a, a survey I did in, in, uh, on Long Island, New York, uh, Sylvester Manor. And we had a, a very shallow archaeology, like a quarter meter. And uh, we had this interesting pattern. And what, what this turned out to be upon excavation is just a, a, a raise of small pebbles uh, beach pebbles uh, that were used uh, for, for lanes between warehouses. And this was a, a, a place where they, they shipped off uh, produce for the, uh, uh, the sugar cane in Bar Barbados. So uh, the supplies were, were, were grown here and then uh, uh, shipped south in part of this, this trade. Um, we have historical evidence uh, uh, through, the, through the 1600s that uh, you know, there was a fire at one time and the, the whole place is rebuilt, and I think uh, the resistivity shows uh, two grid orientations here, and, and so we can hypothesize uh, an early uh, pre-fire and then a post-fire type of layout to uh, this warehouse district with the, uh, um, the shoreline just immediately to the north of the image where they would uh, beach the ships to uh, uh, gain, gain their cargo for the trade. So, uh, uh, you know, stone being very resistant, this, sh this showed up quite well, and we had some, some good results at this site. Uh, next slide. Here's uh, uh, at Bunker Hill National Monument. Uh, we did uh, some resistivity here some, some years ago. But I, I always like this image. You might, might notice there's a kind of a, a faint circle going around the, the, this highly disturbed monument where we have an obelisk and museum and a heavy landscaping. But uh, 
I think that rain is maybe the most promising locus of the the famous uh, readout where the uh, the Patriots held off the British in, in 1775. There's also indications of trails and former walkways and things like this. Um, next slide. Better when you squint. Now, the previous one, it's, it's, you know, the fill of that, uh, there would have been a ditch and then a, a mound for the readout, and, and it changed some of the electrical properties so we could see that through resistance. I like this little case study here because it's a, a cowboy cabin from the 1870s. Uh, we did uh, some post-excavation on it, so we know that um, this tiny cabin, had uh, half of it was a stone floor, and then uh, the right half was a, an earthen floor surrounded by a, a stone foundation. And you can see on the interpretations on the right that the stone foundation, the brown earthen floor, and the yellow stone floor uh, showing up quite, quite differently. And you can see in the 3D image really highlights this difference. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah. Just to illustrate some multiple depths, um, we had a, a half meter electrode separation at, at the Fort Clark Trading Post in North Dakota, uh, where we see you know, some elements of the superstructure foundation on, on, on the, the high, higher resistivity survey. And then uh, going to one and a half meter electrode separation, we could actually see the builder's trenches that held up the palisade around the, um, the trading post, sketched in the upper left there. We can see there were three episodes of rebuilding are, are, are shown, and this was this too was validated by excavations by by William Hunt of the um, Midwest Archaeological Center. Uh, next slide. Our third, our third. Our third best method is going to briefly touch on electromagnetic induction, and this one's kind of uh, uh, complicated. It uses radio energy to get at, at conductivity data, which is the inverse of resistivity, and we see the lower right. Uh, shows conductivity against resistivity. They are indeed the inverse. So instead of electrodes, you just have radio energy going into the ground through a transmitter. And uh, that spaghetti diagram tries, tries to illustrate this, but uh, you have a primary uh, radio energy going in in an inconductive uh, soil that induces a secondary field, which generates eddy currents uh, that are picked up by a, a, a receiver. And the strength of those eddy currents is proportional to the ground conductivity. And uh, this instrument actually yields two data sets. One is co the conductivity of the Earth, inverse of resistivity, and then another part of the signal um, uh, picks up magnetic susceptibility, which is a component of what magnetometry picks up. So uh, and it's a very fast instrument, so you don't have to, you can walk really fast with it, unlike a resistance meter. Uh, so next slide, let's take a look at uh, some of what this can do. So here, here's back to Whistling Elk, where we see uh, resistivity lower left and conductivity upper left. Uh, and on, on the lower right, we can see a, a, a cross section across a ditch where we have high, high resistance means low conductivity. So you can see the inverse right there. In this case, uh, um, the conductivity was not as clear as resistivity, uh, mainly because its target focus is about 0.4 meters, and the archaeology was uh, fully a, a meter deep at this site. Uh, so the, the, the square house in the upper right is, is quite blurring the conductivity data. Uh, but in other sites, it's better. So let's take a look at the next site. Uh, here's uh, Army City, Kansas, which was a, a World War One era uh, uh, town uh, sited to uh, uh, give services to the troops training at Camp Funstead, now, now Camp, uh, Fort Riley. But you can see uh, this is a, a tremendously uh, dry year. It was a drought year. And um, the resistivity came out pretty good on the lower right. But the conductivity couldn't pick up any uh, earth differences at all. It's just pretty much neutral. But it did pick up uh, the, the metal pipes beneath the town because, uh, you know, metal is highly conductive. And so the conductivity was meter was great for that. Uh, so it actually proved to be a useful data set, although it didn't show uh, uh, other minor features in, in the town as well. This resistivity did. Uh, ne next slide. On the other hand, we had an extremely wet year, um, and in, in this case, the conductivity came out better than resistivity, where in these uh, circular earth lodges uh, at the Fort Clark Village, uh, we could actually see interior features, such as uh, you might see that linear feature inside some of the, the earth lodges. That's actually where the leaning posts were, were uh, 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 sited to form the walls of the, of the dome-shaped structure. Uh, and there's even some indications of, of interior features like, like uh, post holes and things like that. 
So uh, trying to activity for its work well, you, you basically need moist ground, uh, and, and we found great results uh, uh, in that circumstance. Uh, next slide. Um, I want to turn to the the other phase, the, the so-called in phase. Uh, so, you know, we have this uh, sine wave signal, and part of it's in phase with the primary signal, which measures magnetic susceptibility, and the outer phase part is, is conductivity. And here, from one instrument in a single survey, we have these two very different data sets, and um, we, we learned that, that firing increases magnetism. Well, Army City burned down. Uh, in the, the early 1920s, and you could see on uh, some of the enhanced magnetism, uh, which I circled in this, uh, and so so we get that a uh, uh, fantastic image that's greatly different than the conductivity data set in this case. Next slide. And this is a, a recent study I've done. We've taken uh, magnetic radiometry, which measures all sources of magnetism, uh, the uh, magnetic susceptibility, which is the induced part as well as thermal remnants, which is from firing. So radiometry gives us the sum of all magnetism, where susceptibility is only the induced part from, say, soil mounting and things like that. Um, we see, you know, we're getting very complementary data sets here uh, with a reasonable uh, moderate correlation between the two. And so I, I think this highlights that uh, uh, electromagnetic induction meters, they give us, you know, two very important data sets, both magnetic and, and, and uh, conductivity. Um, the inverse of resistivity. So uh, in one survey, you can really nail two of these data sets. The drawback was the magnetic susceptibility part. Is it's, it only re responds to shallow depths of a half meter or less. So it has high limitations in that regard. Let's go to the next slide. That's our, our final technique is ground penetrating radar showing uh, uh, some of the instruments um, that we'll, we'll talk about here. So, so next slide. In one component, we saw those orange boxes in the previous. Those are our antennas, and they come in a variety of sizes, of physical sizes, and the size correlates with the antenna frequency. So our low frequency antennas, they tend to go deep, but they give us poor detail. They're also very big. And then our high frequency antennas, they give us a lot of detail on the ground, but they only penetrate to shallow depths. So there's a real trade-off, and uh, most archaeologists use, therefore use a medium frequency antenna that gives a, a little bit of both. Okay, so uh, uh, I think most of us use, are using around 400 megahertz antennas these days, which is a, a good choice. Uh, next slide. So we can see uh, the antenna shoots uh, microwaves into the Earth, and they bounce, uh, go down and, and reflect off uh, um, Earth's features. And, and what they do, they, they reflect off of anything that gives a a, a dielectric contest, a contrast, and uh, the dielectric property is basically the uh, ability of a material to store electrical energy. And so, if you get a, a good difference, uh, you get a, a contrast coming back uh, or, or a reflection. And um, this antenna is, you know, hooked up to a computer which records the data, uh, and it looks very much like what we see on the right, where the antenna is pulled on a transect, and as it's going. Uh, you get these these reflections coming back. You see in the far right in the antenna, it's like a sine wave, and the sine waves are, are color coded or grade scaled as you go along. And when you have a, a large reflection, you get uh, um, you know all the, all these these stripy things like that. So we could see a, a, like a bit big ditch feature and then something else in, in the same profile. And we, we pull a profile and then move over a, a half meter or a meter and then pull another profile and so on to generate. Um, a lot of reflection data. And, and, and um, GPR here is it's really a, a, tr a true three-dimensional method because uh, the vertical axis here is, is, is a, a travel time beneath the surface. It's how long it takes the microwave to go down and come back, and it's a proxy for depth beneath the surface. So next slide here. Let's, let's take a look at uh, some of the details in the profile data. So in cemeteries, uh, we often get these nice uh, hyperbolic reflections over the, the locus of graves. And in general, um, Radar is probably the most productive for uh, uh, cemetery prospecting, finding graves. Uh, it's been, been highly successful in a number of studies. Uh, next slide. It's also useful at getting at stratigraphy. Here's a, the double ditch site. We have some of these large midden mounds. And uh, there was an excavation in 1905, and then we re-excavated the same profile in 2002. And you can see uh, the sloping stratigraphy here. And so this shows that the, these uh, 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 mid mounts were built up laterally with basket loads of earth that were built up from like 
you ever see left to right through time, uh, layers of ash and you know, uh, other sediments being being piled up. And our radar profile of the um, the, the same midden here, uh, we could see um, some of that lateral stratigraphy shown in the reflections right here, which I've colored in in the bottom. So the profiles themselves are very useful for getting at, at stratigraphy and other features. Uh, next slide. Here we see a, a, a further thing we could do is if you take closely spaced profiles, you could take a, a slice out of each one at some uh, um, time or depth beneath the surface, right? And we call them time slices initially because uh, that vertical axis is the, the two-way travel time in the microwave going into the Earth. And if we take a slice and um, a bunch of adjacent slices at the same travel time down there, we could we could make time slice maps. So what we see on the on the right there is is a, a, a high, medium, and, and deep uh, a plan map extracted from these GPR profiles, showing a, a house foundation in the middle, bedrock in the bottom, and then maybe a walkway near the top, uh, going up to this foundation. Uh, if we with a little bit of knowledge about how fast the, the microwaves are traveling, we can convert that vertical axis to depth beneath the surface, generating what we, we would call a depth slice, which we see in the next slide. Here we have a, a depth slice through an Earth Lodge village at Fort Clark. Uh, we see these circles are uh, indications of the lodge floors and then the central hearth in the middle. And in between is uh, they would just throw their, their, their rubbish. So we have you know deep mid in between. And on the bottom, we see a corresponding uh, GPR profile with uh, kind of showing the house floor areas in yellow, the mid area with lots of reflections in between, and then a, a hearth showing up on the right profile with a transect between A and B shown on top. So um, these time slices are, are really great for Earth Lodge archaeology now uh, uh, to, to show some of these features. And we, we in the same site, we actually have superpositioning of houses through time, which is quite interesting. Uh, next slide. Um, there are some issues with GPR. Uh, sometimes I think it's too sensitive. And in the upper left here, we, uh, in the aerial view, shows some uh, rodent damage. This is rodent spoil dirt. You can see all these white and white blobby things. And uh, here's a, a GPR slice right, right uh, on the, the, the uh, upper right images. And I've colored, colored in the, these um, uh, rodent mounds in red. And you can see a lot of the uh, anomalies are from rodents. So uh, remember, we're sorting out the cultural from the natural, where here's a natural cause for these anomalies. And you know, sometimes it, it's hard to see the cultural features for all the other uh, effects that GPR will pick up. So every little rodent hole and sometimes every tree root and every little rock is shown by GPR. And it's oftentimes too much, depending on the setting. Another GPR issue is re reflection geometry. In order for something to be de detected, those microwaves had to go down, bounce back, and, and, and be uh, received at, uh, by the receiver in the antenna. And, and the geometry could be totally wrong for that. And sometimes these the subterranean storage pits, uh, that microwave bounces around and around and never comes back to the antenna. Or often we have V-shaped uh, defensive ditches around the villages, and um, which disperses the radi uh, radar energy away from the receiver. Uh, the U-shaped ditches, however, t tend to focus uh, the energy on the receiver in the antenna, and, and we, we see those quite well. So uh, these are some of the issues to contend with. It's not a totally foolproof method. But in, in the next slide here, we can see that when GPR works, it really does work. And this is one of our, our nicer radar sets from a, a place called Pueblo Escondido in, in southern New Mexico. It's on uh, the Fort Bliss Reservation. But we have all kinds of indications of uh, pit houses and, and pueblos. Uh, and this, this really shows the pit house to Pueblo transition because we subsequently excavated and, uh, and the, the, the upper image there, these are actually independent pit houses placed adjacently uh, to each other in a long row uh, mimicking this later uh, apartment complex Pueblo in uh, tradition that goes on. Um, the lower left shows a photo of the site. There's absolutely nothing on the surface except thousands of potsherds. So uh, GPR was a real boon to the, the site. We could actually uh, focus on where, where the architecture was. Okay. So next slide. I just want to close with this. Uh, the big question is, where, where does all this lead? Uh, uh, here we have uh, Dr. Spock, or Mr. Spock, I should say, from Star Trek uh, with his tricorder. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but um, if you look at the magnetic houses in the upper right, 
those plan views look very close to excavated plan maps that we see from a, a, a Raymond Woods excavations in the 1960s. We could see interior harbors, storage pits, entryways, um, and, and beyond. In, in the geophysics, we could survey the whole village and see what's going on outside the houses, and that's something archaeologists never did uh, in earlier days. But I think uh, there's a rich future going on out there. As sensors get better and the software gets better as well. So uh, let me thank you for your attention, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions if there are any. Ken, thanks very much for that very interesting talk. Does well, anyone have any questions? And the world of training and training. Back in 1980. Well, I have a question, Ken. Yes. Great mind. Um, I was really surprised that um, that you could do vertical survey in mounds. Are That's the right. principles the same? Is that you're dragging your equipment over the surface of the of the mound? Well, I didn't. It's a it's a di different methodology. So uh, you know, we know radar will go vertically into the ground, but uh, you know, often these these mounds are built of clay, and, and clay is so conductive it disperses the radar energy. And in any case, uh, you know, radar often does not go very deep. Uh, where we have these multi electrode resistivity surveys now, and, and what we did, we had uh, uh, 96 electrodes and a bunch of graduate students standing in these long lines, <laughs> inserting electrodes uh, on a 100 meter long track transect. Uh, and it, we have a you know huge box that switches between all these electrodes to do one profile, and we would do one profile about every um, 20 minutes roughly, and just go on and on and on to image the whole mound. But it's it's a different process entirely. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to um I'm going to reveal all of my ignorance here. I have no I've never been on a project that's used any of the methodologies that you have discussed today. And I'm I'm really intrigued. Like where do you get the equipment from? Do you build it or is it repurposed from another field or are there actually companies that are making this equipment for archaeologists? Well, um, in general, it's it's bought commercially. So there's a, a, a number of companies out there that, that generate equipment, and most of it, of course, is for geological prospecting uh. Uh, in, in, in all these instruments. So there are a, a few companies that build exclusively for archaeologists uh, and design for our, uh, archaeological needs. And some of the companies actually actually worked with archaeologists in the design of equipment. So. Uh, um, Barton Industries, for example, has worked with uh, archaeologists to build a gradiometer and then a, a, a downhole magnetic susceptibility meter to, to the specs of what archaeologists need. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of options, and, and um, you know, the equipment tends to be you know, fairly pricey, but it's a good investment uh, in the long run. Um, some of my gear has been working for a dozen years and more, and I'm still still using it. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Oh, very good. Let's go about his trainings. So I know a number of people are still on. Do you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? Ken, have you done any projects with on Park Service land? Well, I, I've been involved with the uh, National Park Service sponsored workshop that Steve DeVore leads um, uh, every summer. I've, I've, I've probably done that a, a dozen or 15 times, and that's uh, uh, usually on a national park somewhere, or uh. under a national monument. So I've been on a, on a bunch of those, and uh, if I, I thought about it, I, you know, I actually, you know, Fort Vancouver, I remember doing uh, an independent hey, survey there. And, Aaron? Hello. Yeah. This is Steve DeVore. Oh, Steve, how are you, Steve? How are you doing? Fine. Hey, how come you left out susceptibility as a fifth method? Well, for lack of time. <laughs> I got you. Um, but for Karen, you know, mentioned in the workshop, you want to come out, we'll show you how to use the equipment. Anybody I would else? love to right. come out. It's going to be at uh, Aztalan State Park in uh, Wisconsin. It's a Mississippian uh, Temple Mound site. It's in, uh, what is it, May 19th to the 23rd. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a great, great uh, opportunity. Make sure that you send us a, an announcement for the egram. I'm working on those. 
Okay. I'll just put a plug in. It's a great workshop because uh, Steve collects a, a, a variety of experts, and then manufacturers are there, and it's a whole week of an intensive field work and data processing and lecture, and it's, it's a great fun, great fun thing. So. Well, I've heard really good things about them. People yeah. who have taken those workshops have um, really sung the praises of the organization and the topics and the instructors that Steve's put together. So it's yeah. really, if you can... If you could make your way to one of them, it's a great opportunity for learning. Hi, I, I have a question for Ken. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi, Ken. It's Meg Waters. Uh, I recognize your voice. How are you? <laughs> um, I'm with the uh, Northeastern office up in Lowell, Massachusetts today. Yes. And you, you mentioned the um, kind of larger scale landscape survey that they're doing in Europe, in England, um, Austria, and those places with multiple sensors. Um, my question is, how far away do you think we are here in the U.S. with putting together those types of systems and, and using them, uh, you know, to cover even larger landscapes than we currently are? Well, I think it's, it's uh, going to rest in the economics and commercial viability of an undertaking. Uh, you know, right now there's a you know, number of smaller companies and uh, various agencies and universities doing this kind of thing, but... Uh, you know, there haven't been, you know, giant projects calling for this or a large number of projects calling for this kind of thing, whereas in, in Europe, uh, I think there's, there's more state-sponsored money to uh, sponsor archaeology at this time. Um, you know, to you know, build a large radar array with, uh, you know, eight or ten antennas, I mean, you're, you're talking, about, you know, it's a significant funding for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think most companies are, are, aren't prepared to do that at this time, you know. Do you think if we had... Um a group of, say, universities or agencies that would come together with the finances, do you think it would be something to have a, a unit of accessible equipment? Um, would that be useful or used, do you think, in the U.S., if we had something like that? Well, I, I sure could have used it. I, you know, for the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years, I've been serving these large uh, Earth Lodge villages in the Great Plains, and it's an enormous undertaking. And uh, to think that uh, one of those uh, larger rates could do it in, in an afternoon, <laughs> uh, where it took me weeks and weeks for each one. Um, uh, yeah, that would be really um, pleasing, you know. Um, yeah, I, I do think there's some interest out there in doing such a thing. So, uh, you know, it, it would have to be explored into, the, you know, into its economic feasibility, you know. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Good hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? Well, Ken, thank you very much for talking with us today. I'm sorry that it was particularly um, challenging. <laughs> well, there, uh, there's a tunnel underneath my building, and they're, they're drilling in, in the, the tunnel underneath, and they, I think right